Hi friends, in this video, we will learn of some popular applications of AI and machine learning on smartphones, many of which you would have already encountered yourself. And we will understand what types of algorithms are typically used to solve these problems. We will also understand some of the real world engineering and science challenges that, that we encounter when we have to run complex deep learning models on smartphones what strategies, both algorithmic as well as engineering, that people use to solve these problems. We'll also give you some pointers to very popular libraries like TensorFlow Lite on how you could leverage these libraries to build applications both on smartphones and IoT devices. So with that introduction, let's dive into this video. So typically on smartphones, all of you would have encountered a lot of applications of AI and machine learning. For example, think of the simple face recognition that you encounter. Some smartphones, they just use the cameras, basically taking a 2D picture and they recognize who the person is and they unlock the phone accordingly. Slightly more high-end phones like the iPhones have a 3D sensor through which they capture not just the 2D image of the face, but the 3D structure of the face so that uh, they can be more secure when they recognize you and they use it primarily to unlock devices even at night time, right? Because they use some infrared sensors. Now this is a very, very popular application and for face recognition applications, the important thing on smartphones is most smartphone companies or operating systems only capture very few images of you to be able to recognize you, right? So they use a lot of few shot learning algorithms, especially convolutional neural network algorithms, which can be trained with just few images. So these are called as few shot CNN or deep learning algorithms that are often used for problems like these. Similarly, you might have encountered photo editing on both Android and iOS. There is, there is an automated photo editing system right now, which taken a photo, it will recognize faces. It will try to edit the color, the saturation, the hue, all of that smartly so that you don't have to tinker a lot. It will give you a fairly good results. Nowadays, when I use uh, both Android and iPhones, I tend to not even bother about editing because I just click a button and all the editing is done. This is often done again using some form of deep learning algorithms, especially convolutional neural network based deep learning algorithms that understand what is a good photo and what parameters need to be changed to attain good pleasing photographs. There is another problem. Again, remember that both face recognition and photo editing happen on the device. They need to, again, all of the computational processing for face recognition and photo editing happen on the device. There is a slightly different application called photo tagging. In this case, what happens is, imagine there are lots of photos of, of, of some person one in your, in your photo role, right? Imagine if you, have, if you have thousand photographs, it can recognize person one. Similarly, it can recognize person two, etc., so on and so forth. Across all these photographs and they can be automatically tagged. Again, some of this tagging processing, this is, this is called photo tagging, so that it will be easier for you to search and say, hey, I want a photograph in which I am there and my wife is there and my son is there and things like that, right? So photo tagging, again, depending on the applications being used, some of it can be done on the device itself. Some of it could be done on the cloud. For example, Google Photos does it on the cloud extensively. Similarly, another very popular application that I use because I spend so much time responding to emails and things like that. I use a speech to text typing extensively. Again, this is, this is nowadays improved significantly over the last decade, both on Android and iOS. You can just speak as long as you're speaking fluently, it will convert your speech to text with a fairly high accuracy. I have observed even for non-European, non-American accents, that speech to text works reasonably with anywhere from 95 to 98% accuracy of words, which is which is pretty good. Of course, you need to go back and revisit it. But a lot of this speech to text also, again, depending on the actual implementation of it, all of speech to text can be implemented on the smartphones itself. So again, this uses deep learning algorithms. Uh, earlier, they were using LSTM based deep learning algorithms. Nowadays, speech to text, because it's a sequence of audio signals as input and a sequence of text as output more modern transformer based algorithms have been used in the recent past. Again, we don't know exactly what algorithm each company or operating system is using. But if you see some of the publicly available research published by companies like Google, Amazon, 
uh, Apple, etc., you can get a sense that they're using, they were using LSTMs earlier and they're slowly moving to more transformer based models. Similarly, another very popular application that many of you would have encountered is something called as predictive test, predictive text and autocorrect. So as you're typing, right, suppose, suppose if you type some word one, typically your, your keyboard, the, the keyboard that you have in your mobile phones can suggest what could be the next word. Or if you do a small spell correction, or if, if you incorrectly spell something, it can autocorrect. Again, predictive test and uh, predictive texting and autocorrecting, there are multiple strategies to do them. Everything from simple algorithmic data structures and algorithms based strategies to statistical NLP techniques. Again, there is some research on using deep learning based algorithms also, but that, that might be a little overkill. Simple statistical NLP techniques, simple algorithmic or data structure based techniques can work reasonably well for at least autocorrect and predictive text. Again, in predictive test, all you have to build is a simple statistical model which says, hey, which word has the highest probability of occurring next given this previous sequence of words? And again, this can easily be trained and personalized based on the user's typing patterns. Another very, very popular modern applications are voice assistants. I've forgotten and I've almost not set alarms manually anymore. I just speak to either Siri or Google Assistant and say, hey, set an alarm at so and so time. All of that is again, deep learning based. Again, voice assistants, again, depending on the task that you're doing, some of the computation behind voice assistants could be done on the smartphones itself. But if you're asking, hey, what, uh, when does this plane arrive? Or uh, what is the distance from here to here? Or how much time will it take to drive from so and so location to so and so location? So some of the processing of the voice assistants can be done on the smartphones and it's actually done on the smartphones, but some of it still needs to be done on the cloud. So for voice assistants, again, a lot of deep learning based techniques, both from speech processing, mostly transformer based models again, and also NLP based techniques are often used here. And they've reached a fairly good level of maturity right now that voice assistants tend to work reasonably well, if not perfectly all the time. And they typically use this hybrid approach where some of the computation happens on the smartphones and some of it on the cloud. Again, the biggest challenges for doing on device compute, right? Whenever you have to compute anything on the device, for example, for some voice assistant, some of the speech to text actually happens on the smartphones. The predictive text, all of this happens on the smartphone. A lot of photo editing, face recognition for identification, speech to text, all of this happens on the smartphone itself. So the biggest challenges for that would be compute. Again, remember that if you have a high-end processor, like for example, if you have a high-end premium iPhone, that has a lot of compute resources that you can use. But whatever you build, companies like Google, who also, have, who also support lower-end devices through their Android platform. So all of the algorithms that they design should work both on low-end compute platforms as well as high-end compute platforms. Apple, on the other hand, has a little advantage because most of their devices have fairly high-end processors, but companies like Google who provide some of these toolkits, who also support Android very actively, needs to make sure that their algorithms and their, uh, their engineering solutions work even on low-end smartphones or entry-level smartphones. Another major challenge is battery. This is always a big constraint with any smartphone. You don't want your compute to be so long running that you're simply draining battery. Again, if you run too much compute, the device will heat up, which will, which, will make, which, will ensure, which will basically result in your battery draining faster. So there are a lot of real world engineering challenges, both in terms of battery optimization, compute optimization, heat and heat dissipation, the actual physical engineering, the electronics engineering part that are also important, uh, important constraints that you have when you have to design on device, on device machine learning and deep learning solutions. Okay. So to actually do deep learning on the device, there are some strategies. Again, there are lots of strategies. There is ton of research, but let me point you to some very interesting basic stuff that work very well. One simple strategy that's often followed is called, is basically building smaller models using a technique called as distillation or student teacher models, right? So what they do is first they build a large complex deep learning model, a deep learning architecture. And then through the process of distillation, they try to convert that into a smaller model where the performance deterioration is quite small. So imagine if I, if I have a model with let's say 1 million parameters, right? Which is a large model. Then 
they could uh, through through the process of distillation you could arrive at smaller models with maybe one tenth like hundred thousand parameters while not having a significant drop in performance there will be some drop in performance but it will be small and not too large right distillation is a very popular strategy there are a bunch of research papers and research strategies like mobile nets projection nets even strategies which are just a couple of years old like learn to compress right these are all research papers and research work done at companies like google this is this is like learn to compress if i'm not wrong is research work from 2018 2019 and again this is continuous work a lot of companies especially large tech companies like google apple etc who actually uh, who actually have lot of a uh, lot lot of devices to support right they work a lot on this again lot of other tech companies also which build some of these deep learning on the devices like amazon through their alexa devices also works on lot of these problems similarly another very simple engineering hack is when you train a deep learning model probably you are using 32 bit floating point values right so you can take these 32 bit floating point values and and round them up or quantize them to 8 bit integers because on most mobile processors 8 bit integer operations are faster of course when you convert something from 32 bit floats to 8 bit integers there will be some loss of information and the model will deteriorate but not significantly so these are called as standard quantization techniques similarly there are also some simple software engineering and data structure approaches like using flat buffers or compressed flat buffer so that it's easier to operate on memory constrained or it's easier to operate on mobile devices again these are just three of the strategies there are many such strategies with tens of research, tens of very popular research papers and lots of open source libraries which actually incorporate many of these hacks both like this is a nice engineering hack this is solid research work mathematically like mathematically solid uh, research work this is more of a data structures or a computer science or a software engineering solution again there are many many more such solutions these are some of the popular ones now if you want to build as of, as of today one of the best libraries that i know of to build android or iphone or any arm optimizer or iot device deep learning solutions is tensorflow because tensorflow does many of these things internally for you of course it's important to understand what tensorflow does and how it does it but if you want to use a library if you already know tensorflow using tensorflow lite is very very simple again tensorflow lite gives you very simple libraries and sdks to use on android iphone also arm devices they also have some methodologies through which you can deploy your code on iot devices especially devices like raspberry pi most iot devices anyway use arm processors so there there is the, again if you want to read more about tensorflow lite you can just go to this developer guide which will tell you how to actually use tensorflow lite on various architectures and processors like this but in addition to understanding tensorflow lite it's also very important to understand what it is doing internally so that you have both a strong foundational mathematical understanding a good engineering understanding and the ability to use popular libraries like tensorflow lite again uh, on on various programs that we conduct at appliedroots.com this is one of the areas that we focus on which is how to build machine learning solutions on smartphones and iot's again uh, tensorflow lite is one of the libraries that that we cover we are also building some new case studies on how to how to actually do machine learning and deep learning on smartphones and iot devices so if you are interested to learn more you could check out appliedroots.com and various ai and machine learning programs that we conduct via appliedroots